XS Wireless Digital is the perfect wireless audio solution for content creators and filmmakers. Thanks to a 2.4 GHz transmission, XS Wireless Digital is a truly plug and play system that allows you to upgrade your in-camera audio with one button operation. With a variety of configurations to choose from, this entry point into the world of wireless will improve your workflow and will expand the possibilities of how you capture audio for your video. For more information, visit Sennheiser.com slash XSWD. The new Super 35 sensor that Canon have introduced with the C300 Mark III is quite a big step up from other S35 sensors that they have created before. From the body and the flexibility that gives us in terms of the expansion packs and the interchangeable mount, to the sensor with its increased dynamic range for tackling scenes that possibly we couldn't have tackled or captured faithfully before. I can get more out of this camera. My money goes further. It's as simple as that from a business standpoint. From a creative point of view, it's unquestionably unlocking more creative avenues for us as filmmakers. Okay, welcome everyone to Pro V Live. Um, I hope everyone is having a great day and a great week so far. It feels nice to be getting a few more streams going a little bit more regularly. So this one is on the FS5 and I'm joined by Alistair Chapman, who I'll introduce in a second. But um, I'm just seeing the amount of chat that's already started in the YouTube comments and on Facebook. So please do keep that coming. This is fantastic. If we get enough questions, this stream can be pretty much dictated entirely by your questions and the way that you want us to to lead the conversation. I am so on board with that. I think that would be a fantastic use for a stream like this. Um, because I'm joined by Alistair Chapman. Say hi, Alistair. Hello, How world. Are How are you doing, Alistair? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, looking forward to this one. It should be interesting. Yeah, I think it's nice to do some um, streams on some products which have been on the market for a little bit longer. I think I, I'm, I'm very guilty, I think, on this channel sometimes, obviously, because we're a dealer, of only really focusing on the latest and greatest, the brand new things, the really exciting new things, when actually the products that have been on the market for a lot longer, one, we sell a lot more of, but also there's a huge amount more people actually out there looking at them and seriously considering them. And they've got just as much questions as people do on the new products. And the FS5 Mark II has been a hugely popular camera over the, I mean when was the when was the actual FS1 FS5 one released it's a while ago I now, guess right? it's got to be 5 years it yeah. was a uh, IBC so I think it's just coming up to 5 it'll be 5 years in September I think yeah. um it's yeah it's it's a while I mean it's a workhorse it really is I mean I've Absolutely. got 
I've got all sorts of cameras, as you probably know. I mean, FX9, I shoot with Venice and, and various things. But, you know, this F, FS5 here of, of my own is, has been through hell and back and around the world more times than any of my other cameras, probably. It, it's, you know, it's just a camera that gets used for so many, so many things. So I think before we get started in earnest, um, Muex Tech has just put in the chat, I like that shirt, Alistair. We should probably clear this <laughs> up before we get started. Yeah, what so, is that fabulous shirt you're wearing? <laughs> yeah, so um, my wife, uh, she's been uh, essentially furloughed or, or she's, she's not working at the moment. Um, so uh, she likes to do a lot of sewing and she came across this fabric online and said, would you like a shirt? And it's like, oh, yes, please. <laughs> so my wife uh, made, made the shirt for me. That and is uh, it is rather fabulous, isn't it? <laughs> OK, so we're starting to get lots of questions coming in on the FS5. Some people um, are actually thinking of buying it and doing it very recently. Um, researching into a lot of it really recently. Um, I can see what Ben Chouette is saying in the comments um asking if we're telepathic by putting the stream on because timing is perfect for him so ben i can see you're already leaving a bunch of stuff down there um, we will get through and answer all your questions so please do leave them down there before we get started do we want to do a little bit of an overview for people who maybe don't know what the camera is do you think alistair uh yeah i think most people probably watching this know know the, the basics of the camera so i think it might, might be good to sort of me to explain how i use it and why i think it's such a great little camera um sure and you know the, the thing about the fs5 is if i'm brutally honest about this camera it isn't brilliant at anything it's <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm just being being honest here. I mean, I know Sony would much rather say, "Oh, Alistair, you shut, you can't say that. You must say it's the best camera in the world." But but it isn't. But uh, what it is, they wouldn't make the FS7 and the FX9 and the Venice and all well, the exactly. other cameras that sit above it. Yeah. Exactly. But but I think what the FS5 is is a really, I mean, for a size, compact. I mean, it is tiny. If we take the top handle off the camera, it, mm. it becomes even smaller. So it's really small. It's very lightweight. It uses a minimal amount of battery power. I mean, the battery that's on this one here, it's been on for a couple of hours already today. Um, it's highly, highly portable, and it just sits in the palm of your hand and I really enjoy shooting with it because of that. I, I really like the fact that I can get into places and move around very freely with it. I know a lot of people that do sort of skateboard videos and skiing, snowboarding, all of those things. They really like using it because of that, that sort of intimacy, actually, that you get with the camera that you don't get with a bigger camera. And I, it, it, it kind of sounds like a really weird thing to say about intimacy with your, your camera. But I think that is something that does exist. And it is important. And, and when you, you become one with the camera that you're shooting with, you're able to shoot faster, more fluidly, get a bigger range of shots. Yeah, you can FS5, you can, yeah, if you're handheld, you can go, to, go onto the ground with it or you can hold it above your head without any problems. And it just makes it a, a real uh, a camera you can play with. And that allows you to get shots that might be difficult with something that's larger and more bulky. In terms of picture quality, it's not going to win awards for its picture quality. It's not a Venice, you know, but it doesn't cost what a Venice does. But considering how small it is, considering how compact and, you know, it records onto SD cards, which are dirt cheap, the quality of the pictures that you get is actually really, really good. And for a couple of reasons, we weren't able to, to, to sort it out. But the, one of the videos I was going to show today, but you'll find it on, on my YouTube channel, if, channel, if you Google the Falcon, you'll find it. And this was the first video that I shot with the FS5. And the reason I wanted to show that video was because that was with a very early prototype FS5 out of the box. And we just went out and we shot this video with it. And it's all, um, it's a mixture of HD and UHD. There's some log in there. There's some conventional gammas. And I think it actually, even now, five years on, looks great. And that's just recording onto the SD cards. We weren't using RAW. We didn't do anything fancy or ProRes. And I hear a lot of people that, that say with the FS5, well, it's only 8-bit in UHD, which is one of the things that is true about it, that when you shoot UHD internally, or even if you plug in via the HDMI, it's only 8-bit. Mm -hmm. But those 8 bits are really good bits. And it's something that I think people need to understand is that, yeah, okay, you can have more bits or you can have less bits, 
But if the bits aren't any good, it doesn't matter how many you've got. Yep. But because those eight bits are good, you can do a lot with it. Even shooting with log, you know, S log two or even S log three, my preference is S log two, internally, eight bit in UHD, it grades, it looks great. Yep. Is it gonna look as good as a Venice? No, but it's so close that most people in your audience would probably half the time never tell the difference anyway. And that's why I like shooting with it because it's just easy. And it's simple. It's, it's light. It, it's small. It's probably one of the best cameras that we've had on the market in the recent times that has successfully mixed the ergonomic and shooting style of a really small camera, like a mirrorless camera, or something like that. Like you were saying, it's 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 just it's it's convenient and it's fun to shoot with. It makes you more creative. Um, and they've mixed that with the pro video features that you need from a larger camera like the FS7, for example, where it's got built in ND, it's got built in XLRs, it's got all the ergonomic physical buttons, all the rest of it that you would need from stepping up from a smaller mirrorless camera. And so lots of cameras have tried to combine the two worlds. Yeah. And I think this has been probably for me, if probably the most successful one that's done that. Yeah, I, I think they that Sony really got this one right. I mean, mm. when you think about what it followed, which was the FS700, and you look at the ergonomics of that, to go from the ergonomics of the FS700, quite frankly, was a disaster zone. To, yeah, to come to the, to come, it was bizarre. It was just, <laughs> what were you thinking? Um, I mean, the FS700 was a great camera. And even now, if you plug a raw recorder into the back of one of those, you can get some amazing images out of it. But then when they, when this came out and you just picked it up and you, you slipped your hand into that hand grip on the side and everything else and it just felt right in your hand it just felt you know the controls were where you wanted them to be and i think to some degree i mean i, I i'm not going to speculate here because i don't know a lot of people are talking about when will it be replaced because as you we said the fs5 is five years old and the, the fs5 mark ii is about two years old now which is you know it, it's it's had a good run yeah. um is what would Sony do to, to really make it that much better to make people need to convert to whatever the new camera is? And I think they'd have a hard job. I mean, yes, you could Absolutely. put 10, I mean, 10 bit, that's, that's gotta be one of the things that a replacement would probably have in UHD. But even then, I don't actually think it would make a great deal of difference to the image quality. I mean, again, there's lots of speculation about maybe putting the FX9 sensor in it. And yes, that would be a worthwhile image quality improvement. But overall, use the camera right and it produces an amazing image. And it would be difficult for Sony to, to significantly improve on that in this size of package, I think. So, you know, I, I think they really got it right. Um, you know, I shoot with DSLRs as well. I've got a A7S in here right now that's uh, I've got rigged up as a second camera if we need a different angle of, 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 the, of the camera here. But I find the ergonomics of those is all wrong. It's just there aren't enough buttons to, to get to the things that you want quickly. There's no variable ND filter. I mean, that's the, one of the big things in the FS5 that makes it really easy to work with. Um, and all of those things. And I, th I think they just got it right. Um, I think if there was to be a better replacement, autofocus would be one of the areas that I'd love to see some much, much um, more improvement. That's a very but... valid point. I, you know, to be honest, if they, if they, they, from the FS5 Mark One to the FS5 Mark Two, it was an incremental upgrade. If they yeah. did another incremental upgrade for the FS5 Mark Three, that was essentially the same camera with autofocus in it, it would be disappointing because we all want more. Like you said, all the the rumors and everything like that. But actually. I think that would be a very, very good camera. Um, yes. That's all that's uh, yeah, needed, Yeah, I mean, fine really, to agree. To make I this think camera a, brilliant. A Super 35, stay at Super 35 because it keeps the, you know, if you put a full frame sensor in this camera, it's going to get bigger because mm -hmm. not just the sensor is bigger, but then the ND filter and all the optics, everything's a bit bigger. So the camera yep. would probably have to be a little bit bigger, certainly wider, I think, yep. uh, wider and taller. So yep. it would it would grow in size a little bit, maybe not by much, but it would be bigger. Um, so I think if you could, you know, even staying at Super 35 with great autofocus, even if everything else remained the same, would yep. be a really nice little camera. Um, Absolutely. We would hope to see a color a color science improvement as well, perhaps. Oh, but then sure. a lot of these things come with a heat and power penalty. You know, the FX9 now we have to remember is 35 watts. It's 
there's a really big power draw and people are finding things like not only do batteries last less in an FX9 than an FS7 because of the extra power, but you also have to be much more careful about your choice of battery. Because if the mm -hmm. battery can't deliver the current properly, the, the life of the battery is further reduced. So in a camera that's this size, you've got to, you've got to watch that. You want to have that low power um, performance still so it's going to be it would be difficult to put a lot of what's in the fx9 in this because i think you'd run into into a power issue and a power wall which then means a bigger that's camera because it gets hotter you've got to get rid of the heat and all that other stuff so you end up with a camera that's way too similar to the fx9 not in terms of spec for their sake for our sake just you need cameras that are different for different parts of the market well you'd probably end up with something that's getting close to an fs7 in size and bulk yeah to get rid of the heat and to do all of that, but with the FX9's features. And I don't think that's really what people want. People want no. this really small, compact camera. And the I would be really- The ergonomics is what makes this camera what it is for me. That, I mean, that, I that is be, what makes yeah. the FS5 the FS5. I'd be really disappointed if whatever, you know, where, whatever, whenever, and I have no idea, replaces this was bigger, bulkier, and heavier. That would just mm -hmm. spoil it, it would ruin it for me. Um, I'd, I'd probably stick to the FS5. <laughs> with my fs5 well yeah that's the thing it, 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 it i'm sure whatever that would look like would be a great camera but it would be a different camera and so like you said you would probably still keep your fs5 you know, yeah I, um, I mean i'm shooting shooting stuff with the venice i'm shooting stuff with the fx9 these days which i know are, are you know image quality wise better cameras but i still shoot I'm not, maybe not as much but i still shoot a huge amount with the fs5 because mm -hmm expose it right use it right handle it right the image quality is is absolutely good enough it doesn't need to be any better than this camera already delivers i don't think i mean obviously we always want more but i don't think it needs to be more so nico and williams has just put in the chat an fs5 mark three with solid autofocus 10-bit internal uhd recording and continuous high frame rate recording rather than eight seconds cache and he'd buy one tomorrow um <laughs> which I think sums yeah, up I'm not quite sure nicely. The, the trouble with continuous HFR, you run into issues with, again, a heat issue. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that's why it uses the buff, the, the cameras currently use the buffering system because the, ca the sensor's only ever having to do that burst of high speed. So you, your heat is, can dissipate between shots. Absolutely. I don't uh, think there's anything wrong with that buffer system. I think the buffer system is actually a really intelligent way of giving users a camera which can get those higher frame rates but just in a way i mean sure continuous is better it's more convenient i say better it's better in some situations it's not better in other situations yes i, I that, and that's an important point actually it's one of the things so i mean i've got various cameras on um, my you know f5 can do 120 frames per second or the fx9 can um, but even if we were to say that they all had exactly the same image quality, sometimes I would still go back to the FS5 and the buffer system, because when you're trying to shoot something that's unexpected, uh, and a good example of that when I go up to Iceland and I film the geysers that suddenly just erupt and you get that, that jet of water, the buffer system is much better for that, because if I was going to stand there, because there's you know, up to a 10, 15 minute break between each time they go, and sometimes they go within a minute. So you stand there and you run for 10 minutes, continuous recording at 2K, 120 frames per second or whatever, and your card's full. And then when the, ge the geezer does erupt, you're right in the middle of changing a card because you filled yep. your card with all this high speed footage. And for that Absolutely. scenario, the buffer system works really well because you're just getting the bits that you need. And so, one of the markets that uses this, the higher frame rates, I mean, so if, by higher frame rates, I really mean anything above 100 frames a second. Sort of think of 100 frames a second as the slowest that you would really go for people. And then anything above that, the, one of the areas that I think does the, th that the most is wildlife. Um, and in wildlife, you are going to fill up your cards so quickly in continuous recording. So yes. quickly. I mean, it, and, and here's a trick that I use a lot. So on my FS5 here right now, you'll see that I have um, an Atomos Ninja 5 on the top and that's connected to the HDMI out. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you can do with the FS5, and I used to do this, I still do use it every now and again, is if I want to do some high speed, is I'll plug in my external recorder 
um, the camera is set to do the cache recording internally. But meanwhile, you have normal speed video coming out of the camera at 25, 30 frames per second, whatever your base frame rate is. So and you can record while that on the... the cache bar is going. Yeah. So while the camera okay. is caching, you can record on an external recorder, the mm -hmm. HDMI or the SDI out if you're in HD, and you can record that at normal speed. And that gives you a normal speed recording and you can run for it. So if you, let's say you're doing a soccer match, and you could record the entire soccer match normal speed. But then when a goal is scored, you hit the record button on the camera and the camera will do the slow motion cache of the goal that's just been scored because you'd have it on um, end trigger. Um, now, at that point, your normal speed recording is going to be interrupted. But what it means is the 99% you know, of the match, you have normal speed and normal file doesn't take up a huge amount of space on your external recorder. But then for the important bits, the goals or fouls, tackles, any of that, each time one of those happens, you just hit the record button on the camera to get your pre-recorded cache dumped onto the internal SD card. And I find that works really well because it gives you the best of both worlds. Ben is actually asking, um, what can you record with a Ninja 5 codec wise? Um, it basically gives you all the ProRes flavors and yeah. DNX HD. Yeah, so the Ninja 5, DNX HD and ProRes with, with the FS5. Um, there is no raw capability from the FS5 with the Ninja 5. It's very yeah. important to note. Yeah, there was um, a few questions about that earlier on. Um, yes, don't don't get confused by the SDI module that you people can get for the Ninja 5. Um, the, the SDI module will get you an SDI signal to come into the Ninja 5, but it won't accept a raw signal. That's something very that's right. different. And for that, yeah. you do so, need So the, the Ninja 5 can do raw with some of the Nikon stills cameras and a few other cameras, but yep. not with the FS5. Yep. Um, the, the, I, don't, I don't know why, I don't really know what the differences are, but it can't uh, and it won't as well. Atomos have been very clear about that. So yep. don't, don't expect an upgrade that will make it suddenly happen one day. It isn't gonna happen. Yep. I wish it would because it would be lovely to have a raw recorder that size. I think it's to do with the processing power that's required. Um, certainly, the, the Sony raw out is a 12 bit. It's not mm. compressed or anything else. So it takes quite a bit of number crunching to get that back down to something that's recordable. It's also quite early on. I mean, what we're talking about is taking a raw signal over a HDMI cable and it's still so early on in that technology. I don't think we know enough about how these cameras that have, have said that they're going to do it are going to do it to really Actually, know it's, whether it's, it's really simple. It's, it's very simple because you have okay. to remember what, I mean, we're going off off topic a little bit here, but what is <laughs> raw? You know, uh, the, 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 you have your camera sensor, um, which is your grid of pixels, and those pixels are sensitive to, to brightness information, to luminance. They, the pixel itself can't see color. The pixel just sees brightness. So to record a color picture, what we do is we put this array of color filters above the pixels so that the pixel only receives blue, red, or green light. But the pixel isn't measuring that the, it's blue light or red light. The pixel just sees that it's light and it's this bright. Mm. So what comes off the sensor is actually just a black and white image. So it's a monochrome image. And when we talk about recording RAW and everyone talks about recording the sensor data, what we're recording is a black and white picture. So all the HDMI has to do is be able to pass that black and white picture, which is a moving video image, no different to any other, to the recorder. And then the recorder just has to then understand what that black and white image represents and then know that, well, that pixel there or that point there in the image was under a red filter. So that represents the brightness of red at that point. So you're only actually recording. All you're doing is recording a black and white image. This, this, yes, it's. It's, it is true to say what you're doing is recording the data off the sensor, but what is that data? Well, that data is a black and white picture. Um, so actually, it's not that, when you think about it, it shouldn't be that difficult to do because you just means you put the black and white picture out over the HDMI. Well, we can do that anyway. And it does make sense because we're seeing more and more cameras come out um, from people who can record raw and normal codecs at fairly similar levels within the same camera. So it's, yeah. it's clearly not something that is so intensive to do um, from a processing point of view. Otherwise, there wouldn't oh, be it's very, from a process, that, that, this is the whole 
that's the whole beauty of it from a processing mm. point of view. It's very easy because you mm. bypass most of it. You just take what comes off the sensor, this black and white image. You'll, you have to number crunch it down because generally it'll come off the sensor as at least 12, if not 14 or 16 bit. And sometimes it's divided up into segments to output it quickly off the sensor. So there's some number crunching required to, to put it into a what what is essentially a video file mm. um but you haven't got to turn it into a color picture you haven't got to do all your sharpening and all the other stuff that generally happens in the camera so from the camera's point of view it's much easier to deal with so interesting though this is it is a little off topic so should we it get is. back to the fs5 mark ii and um do you want to give us a brief rundown as to how you end up using it in your workflow you know how have you been using it over the last couple of years I mean, generally, it tends to end up being a B camera in most mm -hmm. of the stuff that I do. And an example of that, um, thinking straight away, is I, normally this time of year, I'd be out in the States chasing tornadoes and storm chasing. Mm -hmm. So normally, I'll take an A camera. Last year, it was um, a, a Venice. And in fact, I've just realized that I've been sitting on the footage from last year's shoot with the Venice, and nobody's actually seen it yet. And there's some really dramatic material in there. Um, so that's what I'm doing later on today. Um, and I took the FS5 as a B camera. And very often then the FS5 was um, recording onto uh, a, a Shogun uh, as raw out and doing time lapse or doing time lapse and things like that. So I might shoot the regular stuff. The main, my main focus would be on the Venice and then the, the FS5 doing a different camera angle from the same location and things like that. Another area where I use it a lot is on a gimbal. Now, I've been toying with the idea of putting the FX9 on a gimbal, and that would mean a fairly large gimbal. I think I'm looking at the, the Crane 3S, which yeah, is the smallest one, yeah. gimbal that, that will take it. Um, but it's a, it's a bit borderline, and it's still a, a pretty heavy rig to lug around and also to travel with. Mm -hmm. Whereas I've got... Um, I can't remember which gimbal I've got now. I've got another gimbal that I use with the FS5. It's much smaller. It's smaller. It's lighter. Um, I've had it for ages. Um, and I'm, yeah, I can just throw it on there and I can do some gimbal shots. The whole thing is really light, so it, it doesn't get too tiring and too, you know, too heavy to, to carry for an extended period. Mm. Um, I use it in a lot of, I've been recently, so they've just been released actually as I shot a whole load of user guides for the FX9. And the FX9 is it appears in the shot. So I use the FS5 to shoot all of those. Um, and I'm really pleased with the way it looks. Um, it also, you know, it tends often comes up to Norway with me when I go and do my Northern Lights trips. Um, because for traveling around on the snowmobiles and the snow scooters, it's really great because it just actually I've got some really big pockets on my jacket. And if it's stripped by <laughs> it's down, a big it's jacket. Like, the pocket. Um, yeah, so or, what... or what is it about the camera that this many years after you first starting to use it, you are still taking it out there as the B camera on jobs when you've got access to smaller cameras, you've got access to bigger cameras with better quality. What is it just because it hits that sweet spot between the two yeah. that we talked about? It just works. You turn it on and it works, you know, and there's no fussing. There's no, I mean, yes, I, I talk about fussing. I mean, yes, I do plug in a, uh, raw recorder from time to time if i want to do sure. four, i mean four one of the things it can do is 4k 120 frames per second okay it's only in a short burst but the fact that it can shoot 4k 120 frames per second you know a, a really pretty good quality it with the raw is really quite remarkable in a camera of this size um but it is this fundamental thing that you just turn it on and it works it goes mm. um i've got the on the one i've got here i've got just got the 18 to 100 and five millimeter kit lens mm -hmm. now i know not everybody's a fan of this lens but it it's not really par focal but it it's close enough that you can zoom in and out most of the time during most shots um and to get 18 to 105 millimeter at constant f4 in a lens that's just this big is really it's ridiculous actually and and the variable nd filter i can throw that in so i haven't got to worry about sun coming and going and all of that I haven't got to build it into a big rig. Mm. I see all of these people online that spend God knows how much money. And I know you would love them to come and spend the money with you, Carl, and buy all <laughs> the accessories for it. But put so much stuff on this camera trying to turn it into a shoulder mounted 
uh, miniature Harry Alexa or whatever, and that's fine. If that's what you want to do, uh, fill my, your boots. My normal recommendation is that if that's what you want to do, the FX9 or the FS7 is a more suited camera to that. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, the price difference between an FS7 Mark II and this isn't dramatically different enough that it would sway it so much either way, especially when you're buying all those extra bits and bobs around the camera as well. And if you want to have a camera that works like that, buy a camera that works like that. Yeah, I mean, one, an example of where, where, another example actually where I use this camera as a B camera and is, is um, shooting stuff where there is a higher than normal risk of the camera getting damaged. Um, mm. It's a pretty affordable camera. It, it's not 10,000 pounds. I'm not sure what they currently are, but, uh, but um, I've had this one for so long. This is my second FS5 because I have killed one. Um, and that was hanging over the side of a sailing yacht in a Norwegian fjord in the middle of winter in a storm. And a big yep, wave came it. over. And that was the end of the camera. And I'm not going to do that with a Sony Venice, believe me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, <laughs> sometimes, you know, you want to get that shot. You want that special shot that you think will make the production. And sometimes, yeah, you will put a camera into a riskier situation than perhaps you come, you, you, you want to with your main camera. And, you know, that's, that's why this camera was the one I hung over the side of the yacht with and not, not the Venice. Um, you know, so the, there's so many applications. And, and in the finished film, I mean, the camera got destroyed, but in the finished film, the shot survived. And it mm. looks brilliant in the finished film. And if I watch the film, I can see the difference in the image quality, but when we've shown it to all the people that saw this film, nobody notices. They don't because they're not looking for it. I mean, I'm looking for it, so I see it. But if you're not looking for differences, and you, you know won't already see. which camera was which. It'd be interesting yeah. to see if you could still tell the difference if somebody else had shot it. Yeah, it would be hard. You, you, you'd probably you'd probably notice a difference, but whether you'd actually say, "Ah, oh, that was a different camera or not," I don't yeah. know. Whether you just say, "Oh, it's it's the lens," or it's just the way it was being used. Yeah, or the light or the exposure. Yeah, yeah. Right. Should we get onto some questions? Shall we? Um, I think it'd be a good point to do that. Um, Peaking Tomatoes is just saying, "Will we be uploading the stream to rewatch it?" Yep, all of our streams are available to watch on um, YouTube and Facebook after they go live. So, yep, you can watch this back to your heart's content. Um, we've got a bunch of people talking about the Ninja 5 with it and we, they're, they're understanding that it can't do raw um, but they're saying is it still worth using I mean, does it give you a better signal output does it give you um, is, is it still worth it do you see an image quality increase mm, it's a, it's a, that's a, that is the million dollar it's not, well, not a million dollar question but it's a difficult question to answer now, I do choose very often to record to the Ninja 5 um, instead of the internal recordings. If, if the extra little bit of bulk that it adds is not going to get in the way, then I will very often use it because it doesn't take up much space. It doesn't weigh much either. It's a really lovely little recorder. And do I see a difference in image quality if I'm being brutally honest, because I think you want to hear the honest truth and not yep, the marketing speak, is I'm I'm going to say rarely, very rarely, but I do know that what I am recording is a more robust file. Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I know that should I screw up my exposure, should I get my white balance wrong, should I then have to take that clip into post-production and correct it, the ProRes recording will hold up to those that pushing and pulling a bit better than the internal recordings will. They're both, if it's UHD, they're both going to be 8-bit. So I'm not getting more bits or anything like that, but I do have less compression and in a file that is a little bit more robust if you've really got to manipulate it. Absolutely. So it gives me that peace of mind that if I screw something up, I might be able to rescue it um, a bit better than I could probably rescue from the internal recordings. But in terms of the end viewer watching the stuff that I shoot, I doubt anyone would be able to tell what I'd shot internally and what Absolutely. I'd shot on the Ninja. So the I Ninja think it's worth can, having. It can also really help if you, your client is going to be um, defining what your deliverable is. So if you have to have yep. meter required bit rate or something like that for a broadcaster or a delivery network or something like that, um, having that and recording straight into ProRes will hit those targets it yeah and, and the bit, other thing but 
yeah the, the the other thing is that the progress file the, the one the one perhaps thing that i think maybe catches quite a few people with the fs5 is that the internal recordings are xavc l yes. so it's a long gop codec so it's very processor intensive in post-production. Now, if you've got a, a, a workstation, the edit suite that I have here in, in the office, um, I'm currently running the, the, the very latest MacBook Pro, it's really not a big deal to work with XAVCL at all. Um, however, even on my workstation here or the MacBook Pro, I can tell immediately during an edit when I start using, if I've got a mix of XAVCI from, say, the FX9 and XAVCL from the FS5, and I start doing a lot of playback and, and scrubbing through clips and things like that. I can tell which is which because 100%. the XAVC L isn't as smooth. It, it does require more processing power to, to work with it. So the ProRes, that just is, is silky smooth in post-production, um, doesn't need a, a, a fancy computer, a big computer. So that, that can, again, play in, your, uh, play in your benefit. And if you're handing footage off to a client, ProRes, everybody knows how to use ProRes and work with ProRes and nobody has problems with ProRes. XAVCL is, is incredibly well accepted. It really is now. I mean, very few people would be able to, would, would turn around and say, I can't handle this, but many people will be happier with ProRes. That's just the way it is. I mean, ProRes, there's nothing wrong with XAVCL, but ProRes is, is kind of the industry standard codec that everybody knows. Okay, so Matthias is saying, I now have the FX9 and an FS5 Mark II. Haven't had the time to shoot with them together yet. Have you done that, Alistair? No, I haven't. So I, this is only a Mark I. I don't have an FS5 II. Mm. I've, I've shot with FS5 II a lot, and I've shot with, obviously, my own FX9. And what I will say is that um, they, the, the S Cinetone that you have in the FX9 is not the same thing as the... Uh, standard FS5 Mark II Venice look images. They are different and they don't look the same. So um, it's not the most straightforward of things to get them both to match, unfortunately. I mean, it depends on, yeah, if they're two different camera angles, they are probably close enough that in most cases they, 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 your viewer won't notice. But if you put the two cameras right next to each other side by side, they are different. Absolutely. I know that's not what you wanted to hear. No. <laughs> um, so let's go on to some of the others. <laughs> Tom McKenna is saying, can you tell us anything about the new mirrorless camera coming out soon? Who knows, Tom? <laughs> Who knows? I have no idea. I, 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 I don't know. Pass. If there is, we'll all get very excited about it. And I'm sure you'll see lots of streams about that. If there is one coming soon, if there isn't one coming soon, like there hasn't been one coming soon for the last year now, we've all been waiting. Oh God, how long have the FS, A7, uh, S2, root of three rumors been going on for now? Yep. Years. Yep. So, um, and, and I think saying... you also have to think about what's going on at the, in the world at the moment the, you know japan exactly. like here has been shut down for the past three months so everything is yeah there's been no ma manufacturing going on in any volume yeah. you know components parts all that stuff's in short supply at the moment so i think anything that might or might not be in the pipelines is going to be delayed now you just mentioned the venice color science but paul and films is saying how much does the venice color science make a difference versus the mark one in terms of a pleasing picture out of the box and could you apply the color science to another picture profile to get more dynamic range right so uh, the, the dynamic range one is no um you can't uh, get more um so the venice color science so what they did with the fs5 mark ii is they created a picture profile to mimic as closely as possible the way, or, or, or to mimic something that uh, resembles the way Sony's Venice look yep. looks. It was never meant to match Sony Venice. They were just trying to take what people liked about the way the Sony Venice images looked yep. and the, the way that people don't like, perhaps the way that a typical old school Sony camera looks and come up with something that people would find pleasing in the FS5 Mark II, and I think they did a very good job, but it is still the same sensor as the FS5 Mark I, and your image quality, your sort of, your negative is that sensor. So because that hasn't changed, what you're starting with, your starting point hasn't changed, there are limits to how far you can go. 
So if the sensor, for example, can't see a particular shade of green, changing the color science in the in the processing won't ever make up for that. You can bring the gain up to to compensate, but it's never quite the same thing as having a sensor that can see that shade of green. So it it, it gets close to a Venice, it, it, and it is a much nicer look, I, I believe, than the standard Sony look. Um, but one of the things is because this is outputting Rec 709 and you're, it's designed to be viewed on an existing television or monitor, it can't actually have a great dynamic range because if it has a huge dynamic range, it will look flat. Yeah. If you look at log, like which has log. a very big dynamic range, it, it looks flat, it looks washed out. And that's the, that's the trade-off. If you look at the bigger the dynamic range that you capture, the flatter the image will look on a conventional TV or monitor. You just can't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. So you, there's always a trade-off with these gamma curves to get a reasonable dynamic range so that it can deal with most lighting situations, but without it looking excessively flat and washed out on a monitor. Um, and, and a lot of that is done through the highlight roll-off. Mm -hmm. Now, a big mistake that a lot of people make with all of these curves that have bigger than standard dynamic ranges, and so that's going to be the default look in the FS5 Mark II, the cine gammas that the FS5 Mark I and Mark II have, so cine gammas 1, 2, 3, and 4, and also the hyper gammas in cameras like the FX9, FS7, etc., the big mistake that everybody makes with those is that they try to expose them the same as you would 709. And that's not how they work. And these advanced high dynamic range gamma curves, they give you the bigger dynamic range by having a much greater highlight roll off. So the highlights are rolled off much, much more to preserve those highlight textures but to make space for those highlight roll-offs, you have to bring the mid-range down because you can't just keep cramming more and more and more dynamic range into the very small space. So a typ typical camera, Rec. 709, the highlight roll-off doesn't start until you get to 90%. Mm -hmm. And that's because you put your skin tones at 70%. Skin tones will then typically span from about 60 to 80% because that's 70% is the middle. You have highlights like the highlight I have here on my forehead that's going to go up to close to 90%, maybe even beyond that. So you don't start the roll off until just above the skin tones. And actually, typically, your roll off starts where you would expose white. Um, and maybe we're going, hang on, I'm reaching around for a chart. Oh, here we go. So why white? Well, that's because my face will always be darker than white. So we want to keep everything darker than white in a good contrast range. We want faces, skin tones, and all of those things to be contrasty. So we don't start the highlight roll off until we get to white. And in most cameras with 709, white's going to sit somewhere around about 90% on your exposure. So all of your highlights, and that's your reflections off a shiny car, water, a bright sky, all of those things then are crammed into 90% to typically 109% at the top of your recording range. If you're doing broadcast safe, it's between 90% and 100%. So this teeny, teeny, tiny bit of your recording range is where all of your highlights go. And if we actually think that from here, from black, to here to white is actually about five, five and a half stops. That's it. And we're talking about cameras that are capturing 14 stops of dynamic range. If you're going to try and cram nine stops into just 10% of your recording range, it's not going to look great. Mm. So if you want to have a bigger dynamic range, what you do is you record white darker. So typically on these big gamma curves that, that do these bigger dynamic ranges, the, the Venice look in the FS5 Mark II, the cine gammas in the FS5, hyper gammas in the FX9, white is actually designed to be recorded around typically 75%, mm -hmm. which of course is where you would normally have your skin tones. So what that means then is you also have to bring your skin tones down so that your skin tones aren't in the roll off that's starting where your new white level is. So typically with 
like the Venice look, cine tones, etc. Your skin tones need to be between 55 and 60 percent, not 70 percent anymore. But and then that gives you this much, much greater highlight range because you can allow the camera then to roll off from 75 percent all the way up to 109. And that's then you know, nearly 30 percent of your recording range just for your highlights. And they will look significantly better. Mm -hmm. But if you expose your skin tones as you would do normally with these curves, so you put your skin tones up at 70 percent again, the first thing is you start to get very washed out looking faces because they're in the highlight roll off. So they're washing out the contrast. And then because you've exposed all the way up there, you haven't left room for the highlights and the highlights look rubbish. Mm -hmm. So to get the best out of all of these curves, it's really important that you understand how to expose them. And that, that does mean darker. Mm -hmm. Then you run into this. Well, why do I want to have a darker looking image? Or what I would say is go and look at a movie, go and watch a movie. And a lot of us still aren't back to work. A lot of us still have a lot of spare time at the moment. So go and have a look at a movie. Um, if, if you can figure out a way to record a Hollywood movie and then output it on a monitor that's got a waveform or um, uh, even a histogram, a waveform is best. Have a look at where the skin tones are. And you'll find that the vast majority of movies, the skin tones sit between 50 and 60 percent. They're way down there. But your brain, when you watch a movie, adapts very quickly and doesn't find that to be dark anymore. Once you've watched that movie for five minutes, it doesn't look yeah. dark anymore to have those skin tones down there. It just doesn't. So by exposing these, the Venice look curve, cine gammas, et cetera, that bit darker, skin tones, say 60 percent, you're going to actually get a much, much better highlight range and your highlights will actually look much, much better. The sky will look much more realistic. Bright clouds will look great. And that's You'll really get all the advantages part. of using that picture profile in the first place. Yeah. And but if you expose at your normal levels, you won't. Your highlights will clip yep. because you'll be pushing your highlights up, up too high. You might so as well be in the normal one. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Basically, you may as well stick with your normal curves because you're not going to get the advantages because of the way they're designed to work. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's still quite a lot of com um, a lot of confusion, though, about what the Venice color science actually is and means in the FS5 Mark II. And I think some of this is marketing's fault. It, is it right, am I right in saying it is, people can think about it in exactly the same way as a normal picture profile, it, effectively like the s -tone picture profile in the FX9, in the same way as it's just one of the many picture profiles that you can select in the camera, and it's designed to give you, like you've just been explaining, a normal Rec 709 look, but with more dynamic range inside it. Yeah, I think color science has become a much, much, much overused term. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we think about this term color science five years ago, nobody had heard the term and, and nobody was using it. Um, and then I think, you know, maybe we can blame red for it. I don't know. But, you know, red started talking about color science because they do a lot of work with color science. But what color science is and every single color video camera has color science is simply that is how do we get from this image that the, the sensors capture, which even in a three chip camera is three black and white images. How do we get from these three black and white brightness value captures or whether it's Bayer or whatever to a color picture? So it includes the color filters that the camera has. It includes the optical low pass filter. It includes the sensor itself and then the image processing and all the number crunching that goes on beyond that. And it also includes your color grading. So Every color camera has color science because every camera goes from uh, from brightness values to a color picture. Um, all they mean when they're talking about, you know, generally when we talk, we talk about Venice color science, what we're talking about is the way it looks when you take a Venice camera, you shoot, because Venice only really shoots with log. It doesn't have um, a 709 output as such. Yeah. When you shoot with log on a, rec, uh, on a, on a Venice, apply the standard Venice LUT, which is called S709, and how that looks then on a monitor. And when we talk about Venice color science, we're not actually putting a little bit of Venice in an FS5. We're just manipulating that picture profile so that it resembles the way a Venice looks. And it's and nothing more than that. 
not really so that they match nicely with a Venice. It's more because they're using the Venice as an example of what people are wanting from a cinematic image and trying to make the other cameras look and, and benefit from some of that, if that makes sense. I, I think Sony, Sony sort of coined the phrase of the, with, with the FS5 II of the Venice color science simply to really to differentiate between Sony's old color science Mm. which has been around for, a, for for 20, 30 years, which is very much a television look. And this new color science that is in Venice, which is more of a film style look. Yeah. Um, Ven Venice, the way Venice looks is very much designed to mimic film. So the S709 LUT is actually deliberately quite green. It, it has a lot of blue and green hues in it, more so than you'd find in a typical television picture because that's quite reminiscent of how a lot of the old Fuji and Kodak film stocks look. Um, and that's, you know, that, that picture profile or that default look in the FS5 Mark II is just meant to resemble that. Um, and that's all you can do. I mean, it's, it's no different actually to, to taking, I mean, you can take an FS5 Mark I, shoot with S-Log3, apply the Venice LUT to it, and arguably you have a big chunk of the Venice color science, because yeah. a lot of Venice's color science is in that LUT, that S709 LUT, um, which incidentally I helped help develop. So when, before Venice was released, I spent many, many hours up at Pinewood Studios with a guy called Pablo Garcia, mm -hmm. who was uh, one of their color science guys up at there, just looking at tiny, tiny variations in this LUT. We'd have two screens side by side and have two images and, and Venice go, and Pablo was going, well, which is better, that one or that one? And it's like, oh, I can't really tell. And you'd, you'd have a look at the scope and everything else. That, that LUT, I think it took nearly two years to develop. Wow. Um, yeah, it took ages. Pablo um, and then is it, a fantastic colorist as well. He, for oh, people who he don't know Pablo, he, he, he's one, one of now, no, I think that he now does a lot of work with Aces. He's one of the main people on the board of Aces, isn't he? Um, yeah. He, brilliant colorist. Yeah, so, so, you know, you can take an FS5 Mark I, shoot in S-Log, apply that same LUT, and you have actually probably closer to Venice color science than the FS5 II's internal look actually is. So the, that it is just a picture profile. It's all it is with a new gamma curve. And this is why you can't change the, the dynamic range, because that gamma curve is a, like the, the S-Cinetone curves, is very much a predefined curve with a set dynamic range, and you can't adjust it. You can't change that. Okay, so um, Matthew Reynolds has put quite possibly the most important question on this entire th um, stream so far. He said, is it the FS5 MK2, FS5 II, FS5 Space II, FS5 Space II? I can never get the non clementia right and autofocus doesn't help. What do you reckon? Uh, uh, pass. Um, <laughs> I, think, I, think it's, I think the official, I'm trying to think back to what the official line was. I think was. they do two eyes. I think, I think the, the way it's written is two eyes, and I think it's generally referred to as the FS5 II. Yes. So, so there's no so mark. Like the FS, yeah, the F, F, like the FS7 was the FS7 II. Sony don't really like to call it a Mark II because yeah. they don't feel it is a Mark II because it, it is the same camera but with additional options or changes. Yeah. So they refer it. It's I think a new camera. They do like they did with the FS7 and the FX9, which is a new camera. They do they change the model number. The model number but for a for an upgraded or updated camera it tends to be referred to at least as the fs5 II, as opposed to mark II. but I don't, everyone knows what you, if you say mark II, mk2 <laughs> ii the fs5 ii2 everyone knows what you're talking about yeah, fs5 ii um okay so the the last big thing oh i've just noticed um blast parry is saying um why were you holding up a chart to explain exposure you wearing that t-shirt <laughs> that's very true <laughs> <laughs> okay um there's a awful lot of talk about the 10-bit hd versus the 8-bit uht in the camera which is one of the big points with the fs5 specifically in 4k mode in the camera you get um 8 bits and in um hd mode in the camera you get 10 bit and there's a couple of other differences between the 4k and the hd mode as well but i think that's the one that people are talking about the most um they're saying do you get better 
should you be using the better bit depth and the lower resolution or should you be using the higher resolution and some people are saying well the 10 bits should make quite a big difference but they actually prefer the 8 bit from the 4k where, where do you stand on all of this yeah and it's there, there isn't a clear-cut answer on this because they're, they're, they're two different things so obviously if you shoot in 4k as opposed to hd you have higher resolution uh mm -hmm. so you have more uh sort of spatial um detail but if you shoot uh, in hd which is 10 bit compared to the 8 bit then you have more textures potentially mm. um and there's some interesting things here i mean it was, it was something that came up in another conversation i was having with somebody else this morning and um i, I actually had to go away and, and check my numbers go I, I, I thought i had it right so one of the interesting things human vision can only actually see 200 shades um, so the average person can only see 200 shades and an 8-bit recording has up to, it's about 200 shades actually, it's not, a, it's not 235, it's less than that. Um, so an 8-bit recording can actually capture as many shades as most people can see anyway. So does 10-bit give you something more? Uh, you could argue that no it doesn't, but that's only if you don't manipulate the image. So if you never manipulate the image, don't do anything like that, then 8-bit is perfectly adequate because it captures what people can see. However, of course, these days we tend to manipulate our images a lot. So then the question becomes, is it better to have more resolution or is it better to have more shades and more tonal values? And, and it's, it's not, there is no one fits all answer to this. If you're shooting something that contains a lot of detail, then you're going to want higher resolution. But if you're shooting something where tonal values are very important, and actually one of the areas where tonal values is, is important is spaces and skin tones, then perhaps the 10 bit will win out if you're going to start manipulating the image a lot. Um, overall, I do feel personally that I prefer the UHD, the 8-bit the recordings, because I do think that the internal downsampling to the HD that the camera does isn't perhaps as refined as it could be. Yeah, you know, this is this comes down to this whole power and power consumption and processing power thing. You know, FX9, a camera that has a lot more processing power, does that downsampling much better. And I think the downsampling from UHD to HD in the FS5 is, is not as good as perhaps as we see in some other cameras. And as a result, sometimes just shooting in UHD, even though it's 8-bit and down converting it to HD can deliver a more rounded, I think is probably the word I'm looking for, result. Mm -hmm. But it's, not, it's definitely not clear cut. Um, my preference is UHD. Uh, an 8-bit because I generally for my clients need UHD and generally it's a B camera within another program with what I'm doing so mm. that little bit of 8-bit doesn't hurt. I mean I and this is another reason actually why I wanted to show that first film that I shot with the camera the Falcon there's some um, log footage in there that was actually really quite heavily graded and it was UHD and it looks fine. Mm. I think a lot of people assume that 8-bit is just going to fall apart and disintegrate as soon as you try and grade it. And while it isn't ideal, it does actually hold up fairly well to quite a bit of pushing and pulling. Um, a lot depends on the grading software. So, you know, if you've got something that does have steps between it, between the different shades, when you grade it, you would hope that your software is going to you know, if you're if your two steps that you've captured are here and what you need to end up with is this value in between, you would hope that your software isn't just going to put in a step, but it's actually going to say, well, what's halfway between these two and do the calculation to to give you an approximation of what that value is. So grading software plays a big role in the end result. Um, what I'm grading using software, which, yeah, to resolve, right? Yeah. So I'm using resolve because I find that that does definitely give me a better result than I see from certain other tools I'm going to use. Um, and then, the, you know, there's, there's also how you shoot it. You shoot it well, and you haven't got to push and pull the image too far, so you're not running into problems. And the other thing to add to this is, is your monitoring. I know a lot of people see banding in footage on their computer monitors when they're looking at, at content after they've been graded, but very often that banding isn't actually there. 
it's down to the way a computer internally handles your footage. So what you must have before you start worrying about banding is a proper dedicated video card. So I'm not talking about a graphics GPU, yeah, your Matro, sorry, your NVIDIA, um, NVIDIA card or your AMD card, but uh, either something like a Blackmagic, Decklink, or uh, there's various other, uh, Arja, Matrox, whatever, make dedicated SDI and HDMI cards for your computer. And it's really important to use one of those so you can actually see what the footage is actually doing rather than what the computer is doing to your um, content. Absolutely. Um, we, we try and use one of those as much as we possibly can while editing because you can do it on all sorts of scales. You can, if you've got a bigger PC, you can have PCIe cards that are in there, like the Decklink ones and the Matrix ones and everything that you, you just said. But they also make the little Blackmagic mini monitor, which is yep. just so useful. It's a tiny little box. It just plugs into something like a laptop. There we go. It's one behind you. Um, it's one there. The, these are so common um, for just simple 1080p out to a proper broadcast monitor of some sort, some description, and um, exactly like, you can even use the same monitors with it, just using that to bypass it. I mean, obviously that's not the preferred way of doing it. Um, but like you say, it is so important for a good color work. Yeah, I, I, I see people tearing their hair out over banding and then I get them to send me the clip and I look at it and I'm like, what, what's Where's your problem? Banding, it looks yeah. great to me. And then, then you go through their whole workflow and you discover they're just looking at it on their on a computer monitor direct off the desktop of the computer. And, and it's like, well, actually, that's probably where your banding's coming from. The footage is actually fine. Absolutely. But back to the FS5. So you, yes. you tend to stick in the 4K mode most of the time um, because it gives a more all-rounded um, Result. Yeah, I, it, it's, it works for me, it works well. Um, I, I feel that is where this camera performs at its best, even though it is only 8-bit. And it's extremely rare to come across image artifacts such as banding. Most banding actually isn't caused by 8-bit. Most banding is actually caused by the compression in the codec. Yep. Um, you know, it, it's very rarely because you've shot with 8-bit. It's generally because your codec is, is uh, macro-blocking. XABCL is a very good codec for things like that. It should handle it perfectly fine. And if you're worried about it, of course, you can just take it out over the HDMI or the SDI to an inch five, um, something like that for the ProRes. So. There's so many ways around that other than just taking the whole leap up to 10-bit. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, as I say, said at the beginning, it's all about good bits. If, you, if your bits are good bits, I'd much rather have eight good bits than 10 poor bits. Yeah, and so, yeah, that, that, and that's, that's actually the 8-bit output that this camera has performs way better than, I, than it should do, really. It, it yep. just, they, they seem to have just got that bit right. Absolutely. Okay, I think that's a really good place to, to finish for today. So thank you so much for joining us, Alistair, once again. Um, it's been great to have you on board for FS5. And I think we should definitely do some more of this. I think we should go back and look at some of the, the current cameras that aren't perhaps the newest to the market, but the ones which are very popular and people well, are these, using a lot. These are the workhorse cameras. These are the cameras that are making people money right now. You know, FS5, FS7, uh, and the cameras that, as you say, have been around for, a, for two or three years at least. They're the, they're the cameras that, that people know, that people trust, that people specify. So they're the cameras that people are making money with. Absolutely. Um, and I, I really do recommend people um, head over to Alistair's website, XCD Cam User. Um, look up that um, FS5. It's called the Raven, is it, um, Alistair? The Falcon. The Falcon, the Falcon, sorry. The Falcon. And it was one of your, your launch films with the original FS5, wasn't it? I remember it well. Yeah, it was. Um, it was I shot ages ago. And I go back, I looked at it the other day and I thought, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, yeah, you know, I, I was pleased at the time with it. And I, mm. even now I look at it and think, you know what? That camera performed really well. Absolutely. So de definitely go back, have a, have a little look at that. Um, and he's got a whole bunch of other useful resources in his website, like lookup tables and things like that. Um, RM um, is actually saying in the in the chat, Alice Chapman lookup, A7S lookup tables are great. Um, so people out there are using them, but in case you're not, definitely go have a little look at the resources that Alice has got on his website it is well worth it but thank you so much for your time yeah thank you everyone and i uh, hope everyone's uh, getting back to some sense of normality at least uh, it's all getting a bit tedious now isn't it 
Yep, we're getting there slowly. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for joining us on this um, thing. Thank you for everything you've been putting in the, in the comments. Um, and we've got one more stream left this week. I'm going to be doing one by myself, which is a little bit scary. It's not what I'm used to at all um, tomorrow um, to be talking about the live streaming setup and the changes that we've made here at Pro V for Pro V Live. Um, I did notice some some comments on how good the stream was looking earlier. So fantastic. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, if you want to know more about the setup that we're using, um, tune in tomorrow at 2 p.m. and I'll be going through it there. But for now, thank you all very much and I'll see you all tomorrow. MKE 600 is a shotgun microphone ideal for professional video camera applications. Yeah. Maximal rejection of ambient side noises thanks to pronounced directivity. And because the MKE 600 has a very good suppression of structure borne noise, it makes one of the most versatile all round shotgun microphones on the market.
XS Wireless Digital is the perfect wireless audio solution for content creators and filmmakers. Thanks to a 2.4 GHz transmission, XS Wireless Digital is a truly plug and play system that allows you to upgrade your in-camera audio with one button operation. With a variety of configurations to choose from, this entry point into the world of wireless will improve your workflow and will expand the possibilities of how you capture audio for your video. For more information, visit Sennheiser.com slash XSWD. The new Super 35 sensor that Canon have introduced with the C300 Mark III is quite a big step up from other S35 sensors that they have created before. From the body and the flexibility that gives us in terms of the expansion packs and the interchangeable mounts to the sensor with its increased dynamic range for tackling scenes that possibly we couldn't have tackled or captured faithfully before. I can get more out of this camera. My money goes further. It's as simple as that from a business standpoint. From a creative point of view, it's unquestionably unlocking more creative avenues for us as filmmakers. Mm -hmm.